Mr. Elroy's Scarecrows. The Elroy farm sat on the outskirts of town. There weren't too many homes out that way, just three neighboring farms and two standalone homes. Now the children who lived around there were always told not to step foot on Mr. Elroy's property. The young ones abided, but the older kids, the teenagers, were always messing around in his cornfield and tearing down his scarecrows. Mr. Elroy would chase them off with a pitchfork, calling them every name in the book. Every morning, he would go into town and deliver fresh corn from his fields, always complaining to the teenagers' parents about the mess they caused and never having a kind word for anybody. As it got closer and closer to Halloween, people in town claimed Mr. Elroy was becoming more and more agitated by the day. But things reached its boiling point the day before Halloween. They say he blazed into town in his old pickup, screaming and hollering out of the window. He came to a screeching stop in front of the farmer's market, got out of his old busted pickup truck, and shouted and complained to any parent he could find. See, the night before, not only did the teenage children tear down his scarecrows, but they destroyed all of his Halloween decorations. He begged and pleaded for something to be done to these destructive teenagers, but their parents would just look at him and bullshit him. Yes, Mr. Elroy, we'll punish them. Or yes, Mr. Elroy, we'll ground them. But he knew it was just bullshit. He saw those kids out and about every day and night, walking past his farm. Mr. Elroy was done. He lost it at that very moment, on that very spot. He screamed at the top of his lungs, for everyone to hear. If changes were not made, and if something wasn't done, he would take matters into his own hands. Now, sadly, no one must have believed Mr. Elroy, because his threats were not listened to. The parents, as usual, did not punish their children. Halloween was the next night. A Halloween that will be unforgettable to those who live there for the rest of their days and future generations. had said that when Mr. Elroy returned home, he was still angry. But to calm his nerves, he put back up his Halloween decorations, making his farm look the most festive in the entire town, then put back together and erected his scarecrows. He worked all through the night, making sure his farm was ready for Halloween. As midday afternoon approached the next day, all the teenagers gathered after school and decided to dress up and go trick-or-treating, even though they were all too old to be still doing so. But it wasn't the candy they were after. Sure, it's nice to get free candy, they thought, but they were interested in more sinister pursuits that evening. They all walked past Mr. Elroy sitting on his porch, on their way home to get dressed up for the night. They stopped and looked at him. One of the boys yelled, Hey, old man, we'll be back tonight, and you have a surprise coming to you. It is said that Mr. Elroy just sat there and grinned, grinning a wide, sinister smile from ear to ear. As it got dark, the group of teenagers gathered together. All but one showed. No one knows why that member of the group didn't show. Some say they had gotten sick. Others say they thought something bad might happen that night. Whatever the case, the rest of the group plotted their plans of cruel pranks and tricks that night. From stealing younger kids' candy to egging people's houses and leaving bags of flaming shit on people's front porches. They say the group was horrible that Halloween, causing nothing but trouble in the neighborhood the whole night. 
The last time anyone officially saw them was about ten o'clock, heading down the road towards Mr. Elroy's farm. Half past midnight, however, the teenager's parents started to get worried. They searched the entire neighborhood, but found nothing. They went to the home of the teenage girl, who decided not to go, and asked her if she knew what they were doing that night. She said yes, and told them that they were going to go down to Mr. Elroy's farm and really destroy the place worse than ever before. When the parents heard that, they looked at each other in shock and utter dread, with the threats from Mr. Elroy playing through their heads. They rushed down the old dirt road and stopped in front of his farm. The whole house was lit with dimly lit orange and purple lights strung up over the porch and roof. But just beyond the wood fence, one of the parents noticed a row of scarecrows much more than he usually has, they thought. One of the parents shined a flashlight at the row of scarecrows. They looked bloodied, and the parents noticed that they were dressed the same as what their children were wearing when they left. A few of the parents jumped the fence when they saw this. When they reached the row of scarecrows, they saw they were completely covered in fresh blood. One of the fathers pulled the sack off one of the scarecrow's heads. Then a scream rang out from one of the mothers. It was her child. Then one by one, they took off the sacks and each time revealed the next parent's child, all lined up in a row. There was a silence in the air from the shock and disbelief. The only thing that broke it was a maniacal laugh from the porch. It was Mr. Elroy. How do you like it? The display was rushed, but all in all, I think it's a pretty damn good job, if I do say so myself. I told you, if you didn't do something about those menacing kids, then I would handle them myself. the scarecrow on my grandfather's farm. I grew up spending summers on my grandfather's farm in northern Pennsylvania, days where the heat danced in lines above to rolling hills and the nights left the soil cool to the touch. Rows of corn stalks that swayed in the whispering wind like soldiers slowly marching across the fields. The scarecrow, in his sun-bleached red flannel shirt and his dusty powder blue overalls, stayed stiff in the wind. I was eight years old, my baggy brown t-shirt rippling on my body like a curtain as I watched the rolling clouds turn gray. Elias! Get your ass in here before the storm gobbles you up, I heard my grandfather say. I looked back at him and then back out to the black clouds and slowly dancing sea of stalks. The wind had blown the straw hat from the scarecrow's head. I walked to it, the wind blowing back my hair as the straw hat rolled towards my feet. I picked it up and approached the stiff man of straw who bent forward and snatched it from my hands, placing it on his glaring potato sack head. He resumed his position, standing rigid against the wind, immovable. Scarecrow. When I was a kid, and lived in the country. My neighbors got a scarecrow. It was a peculiar thing, considering they didn't have any fields. They just had the scarecrow displayed in the middle of their large backyard. I remember my dad asking the wife about it, 
and she said it was a gift from her husband, who had gone on a business trip recently. I don't remember what he did. It wasn't hurting anyone, so no one had any issue with it. That was until summer came around. It smelt disgusting, like rotting meat, and flies would swarm around all day. When my dad asked the wife about it, she took it down and threw it away. Soon after that, she moved, in a hurry apparently, as most of her stuff was in their house. We never saw her or her husband again. The Scarecrow House I didn't much like where I lived, but I will admit that I did like how united the people in my town were sometimes. Sure, there was never much to do, but people were there for you when you needed them. It was nice to feel like your neighbors were all extended family, you know? City kids don't understand that. Take the holidays, for instance. Every year, everyone went all out on the decorations, even the farmers on the outskirts of town. It made trick-or-treating even more special to have every house become part of the atmosphere. The best part was that you never missed out. A few hours in, and you'd gone through the whole town, even if you stopped to rest or eat some of your candy. Unfortunately, the passion we had for the holiday didn't last. You see, it was tradition that the kids went out on their own. The closest thing we had to supervision were the older kids, who were encouraged by their parents to bring their little brothers and sisters along. That's what I was doing on that last Halloween, the last day we all celebrated it together. We were a couple hours into it, my little brothers and me. I wasn't collecting candy, just enjoying the night and keeping an eye on them like my mom told me to. I wanted to head home after a couple of hours, but my brothers wanted to see the farmhouses on the edge of town, and I relented. The decorations, even out there, were fantastic. One farmhouse had jack-o'-lanterns everywhere, each with a different spooky or funny face carved in. Another had a front porch absolutely covered in fake cobwebs with rubber spiders all over the candy bowl. Then there was what I called the scarecrow house. See, there was this long path between the road and the house. On each side of the path were endless rows of corn, and all along the path were over a dozen scarecrows. Tired, I told my brothers that I'd wait for them by the road. I took a seat near the side of the road, watching as they made their way towards the porch. The light wasn't on, but I could see a candy bowl waiting for them. I closed my eyes for a moment, and when I opened them, I realized that I'd been nodding off. I looked up, and my brothers were nowhere in sight. The scarecrows were all gone, too. I called their names, but no one responded. I tried to build up the courage to approach the house, but I couldn't do it. Instead, I ran to another house down the road and got the old woman living there to call the police. They searched the house that night and found over a dozen pairs of old clothes and hoods that match my description of the scarecrows. No traces of my brothers or the men who were wearing those costumes that night were ever found. The Family Scarecrow there was an old, beaten-up scarecrow in the corner of my family's barn. The scarecrow has dark eyes, frayed sleeves, 
and a crooked hat atop its head. As a kid, I avoided it as its stitched eyes peered out from the deep corners of the barn and into the field where my siblings and I played. The scarecrow has been in that dusty corner of the barn for as long as I can remember. After I took over the family farm, my dad and I decided to clean out the old barn, and my first mission was to get rid of that creepy scarecrow. I picked up the old humanoid pile of straw and lugged it to the trash can. The next morning, I went back into the barn to continue cleaning it out. I opened the door and glanced at the corner where the scarecrow was slumped in the same spot it had been sitting in for decades. I noticed its face had altered a bit. The scarecrow was smirking at me with a glint in its eye. As if it was thinking, you thought you could get rid of me, huh? Maybe my dad brought it back into the barn, I thought. I tossed the scarecrow into the garbage again. The next day, I woke up to continue our work in the barn. I grabbed my coffee and walked out the back door of the house, but stopped when I saw something in the corner of my eye. The scarecrow was sitting on the back porch swing, facing the house. I ran out to the barn where my dad was already cleaning. Dad, are you trying to prank me? I said. Why did you move the scarecrow? He looked over to the corner of the barn where the scarecrow normally sits, then looked back at me. I didn't move it, he said and shrugged. Must have a mind of its own. The so-called mind of its own was too much for me to handle. I'm not going to deal with some possessed, Annabelle-esque scarecrow. I walked back up to the porch where the scarecrow was sitting on the swing, swaying slightly in the wind. Screw this scarecrow, I thought. I took it to our fire pit, poured lighter fluid on it, and threw a match on the top. The scarecrow burst into flames. As I watched the straw burn, I saw that smirk and dark eyes disintegrate in the fire. And that's that, I thought. The next day, I woke up ready to finish up with the barn. I sat up in bed, and in the corner of my bedroom was the scarecrow. Not a burn on it. It had an even larger smile on its face, and its deep obsidian eyes were peering at me from that corner. Must have a mind of its own, I muttered. The Scarecrow Killer Samson was a quiet town. Most people who were born there stayed there for life, harvested the crops their fathers had planted, and planted the seeds for the next generation. Now, if you didn't stay in Samson, you didn't wander too far away, not more than 50 miles at least. Samson was a quiet town until the scarecrow killer. On the night of September 28, 1897, old Mrs. Miriam Grant went into the field to find Mr. Grant all hung up on a post, arms splayed and straw stuffed in him every which way. She was originally suspect number one for his murder, but then the next week, while Mrs. Grant was still a weeping in her cell, Mrs. White found her husband, Joel, in much the same condition. It was quickly realized something bigger was going on. There was a killer, serial kind. The hunt went on for months, and the killings kept on going. But once the harvest season ended, the killings stopped. Families laid easy through the Christmas season, and parents tucked their children 
without a care. They forgot about the scarecrow killer until the next harvest rolled around. September 13, 1898, John Rivers found his father slung up on a post in the same condition as Mr. Grant's before him. I just about had it. If I see any dead man in my field, I told myself, I'm going to find the man before he got away. And then, sweet Jesus, it happened. A figure, splayed out on a post, had popped into my field. I loaded my shotgun and ran through the corn, trampling over the soil that had once been my father's. I was going to end this once and for all and put Samson to rest. But when I saw the scarecrow up close, it was just a scarecrow. Damn it, I cried. Who would pull a man's leg like this after what had happened? Some Adeline juvenile, certainly. I kicked the scarecrow down to the ground. You're just straw and hay. I said, spitting on its button eyes. I turned and started walking away. And you're but flesh and blood. A voice rasped behind me. I turned to the scarecrow up on its post once more. I walked to it again, looking for who had spoken. Now who in Christ's name? Christ. The voice asked, with a chuckle like the sound of corn husks. Don't you go start blaspheming, I warned, whipping around. I can take you down to the station soon as I like. Something struck me in the head. I fell to the ground and dropped my shotgun. I rolled over to see who it was and what hit again, this time in the ribs. A blurry figure stood above me. Who are you? I coughed. As he leaned down, his face came into focus. He stared into my soul with his button eyes and rasped. Just straw and hay. The Scarecrow's Daughter Old Harry was a practical man prudent, a firm believer in all things logical. That's why he had a tough time understanding what happened after his cow disappeared. At first, he thought it was coyotes, but when he saw the carcass wedged high in a pine tree by the cornfield, he had to reevaluate that. She was a milk cow named Betty, and he'd had her since she was just a calf, and so it pained him to see her stuck up a tree. Try as he might, he was at a loss for a good idea of how to get her down, and so there she remained. He'd come outside every morning and see Betty up in the tree, and he'd wonder at what could have done such a thing. On the third day, he noticed her belly swelling slightly, and he stared at the body of the old cow for quite some time. The next day, when he came outside and looked up at Betty's corpse, he saw a ragged hole in her stomach, the distended belly having been burst open from the inside, intestines and viscera hanging in dirty coils from the pine branches. He walked out next to the cornfield to get a better look. He didn't yet notice that next to his scarecrow there was now another, much smaller one, with cow's blood and her long, stringy hair. The Scarecrow Last week I went with my buddy Chuck to pick up his new BB gun. We took a shortcut along a farmer's dirt path on our way home. While walking and laughing at each other's jokes, 
we came across an old scarecrow. It looked pretty beat up, button eyes, hanging on by thread, mouth sewn closed with a coarse thread, straw hat barely attached. It had definitely seen quite a few seasons come and go. Chuck and I looked at the scarecrow, looked at each other, and got big grins on our faces as we took out the brand new BB gun. We took turns shooting at it. Chuck was a much better shot than I was. He actually managed to shoot off both of its eyes from 30 paces back. The sound of the BB hitting the scarecrow's stuffed head was a little different than I would have expected. It almost sounded like the scarecrow grunted when it was hit. After a while, we got bored and decided to go home. Two days ago, I noticed the scarecrow had been moved up to the edge of the field, closer to the road. Oriented, so it was looking directly at Chuck's house. I figured it must have been the farmer rearranging his fields. Yesterday, Chuck was found dead, his eyes gouged out and his mouth sewn shut. Last night, I noticed that the scarecrow was facing directly towards my bedroom window. Scarecrow Growing up in a rural area, there are many scary stories intended to keep children inside when it's getting dark. Usually, they include the famous, It's true! It happened to so-and-so! With no way of confirming, of course. I did always feel uneasy walking home from my best friends, as if someone was watching me. But as a kid, I always had curfew, so I'd be home before dark without any issue. As a teenager, however, I had gotten bolder. I started avoiding my curfew that was still set at sunset. One of us. Now walking through the cornfield, I regretted it. The feeling that haunted me during daytime was much stronger. My mind sensed someone near me. I couldn't help but look around continually. That's when I noticed the scarecrow. Or rather, the lack thereof. Where there had been an eerie-looking scarecrow, there was now empty land. Had someone removed it? One of us. Something settled in the corn behind me. I bolted. Initially, I kept to the path, but I soon ran into the corn itself, as there was a shadow on the path before me. Stocks hit me in my face, scratching my arms. Had corn always been this sharp? I felt blood trickling down my arms. My clothing was scratched all over. Suddenly, I was in a wide clearing. I stopped and tried to orient myself. It was dead quiet. Still, my back itched as if someone was right behind me. One of us. In the blink of an eye, I was surrounded. There were four of them. The one in front of me looked like Lily, a girl who had gone to some big city a month ago. Rumor was that she had escaped her parents, as no one had heard of her since she left. I understood now. She never left town. Neither did the others around me. The one to my left, though, I didn't know. But I knew it didn't matter. I'd find out soon enough. With my ripped clothes and dirty face, I already looked like one. Now, I was going to become one. It felt oddly peaceful, as if it was meant to be. One of us. A monster killed my first love in grade school, so I hunted it down. It happened between 1974 and 1975. 
Over the course of that year, six girls went missing from their neighborhoods. This was prior to missing kids appearing on the sides of milk cartons or up to the minute news. So when the kids went missing, it took a while for word of mouth and posters to circulate. And even then, most disappearances would be pushed aside and dismissed as a runaway. Our town had a modest population, but was vast in size. Farmland, woods, and lakes surrounded us. We were an industrial town and had a steel engineering plant that employed most of its citizens, either directly or indirectly. That year, there were nationwide strikes going on in the steelworkers' unions. New contracts were proposed and rejected and the workers walked off the job. Truck delivery blockages and clashes with the police ensued. Neighbors, friends, and family chose sides, which aggravated the situation more. The whole town felt like it was steadily tearing itself apart. And all the while, young girls between 10 and 14 years old were disappearing, and barely anyone was noticing. Then Anna Roberts was taken. I'd fallen for her the first day of grade one. She was the kind of girl who immediately draws everyone's attention to her when she enters a room. She was sweet and kind and funny. She quickly became the most liked girl in class. By grade eight, I was hopelessly in love. I never knew how to tell Anna that, of course. I was shy, and she was popular, so she never knew. Then Anna was gone. I remember the morning her seat was empty in class. Then I remember two days passed before a cop came to school to talk to anyone who may have information on her whereabouts. It was the town sheriff, Walkley, who did. He was my best friend Pudge's dad. I remember feeling bad for him. The last year of high tension between his citizens had taken a toll on Walkley, and he looked ten years older. I'm sure the last thing he wanted to do at the time was investigate another missing girl. Following his visits to our class, he pulled me aside and asked me to talk to the other students and find out anything I could. I agreed and asked him how the investigation was going. In one word, good. In two words, not good. There were no signs of struggle at Anna's home. Her room was neat and tidy, nothing missing to indicate a runaway. There were no witnesses, no suspects, no clues, no leads. Walkley left, and I realized they weren't going to find her abductor. And I was right. The investigation hit a wall. Time passed, and Anna joined the other five forgotten girls, in spite of high anxiety and rioting in the streets. But the schools were still buzzing with gossip. Stories floated through our junior high of who or what was committing the abductions. Some kids said it was a criminal who escaped from a nearby mental ward. Others were saying there was a psychotic vagrant who came in on the trains once every two months to find his prey. He'd bring the girls' bodies back with him on the trains to be dumped somewhere in the country, which was why they were never found. But the prevailing theory among students was more local. In our town, there was a large cornfield that pushed into it from the south, making a direct route across impossible. You had to cut through the field by foot or drive around it to get from east to west. If you were driving, it wasn't a huge detour, but if you were walking, it could add an hour or two to your trip. Still, Lots of people cut through it by foot. 
It was mostly teens and children, but some adults did too. Though I should say it was only brave teens, children, and adults who did. Every time you entered the fields, whatever row you picked could lead you to what the cornfield was most known for, its scarecrows. There were dozens of them. The owner of the property, Leland Wallace, shifted them around on occasion, giving the impression they were moving on their own. For many, this left more than just an impression. But it was also the way he made them, with all kinds of strange nails, splinters, and patches of fur covering them. He painted a bunch of old, dried-out cow skulls, black, and used them for the heads. Many of the students believed the scarecrows climbed off their posts at night and went looking for girls. When the scarecrows found the girls, they'd tear off their hands and feet and stuff hay into their arms and legs. Then they'd cut their throats and stuff dead crows into their chests. The missing girls were now up on posts, rotting away in the fields. And they were now a part of the scarecrows, one of them, and would go after any girl that entered the fields. No one dared to check the scarecrows to see if any of them were the girls. It was way too scary to even think about. The scarecrow idea was shrugged off by anyone above the eighth grade. It was Santa Claus and Easter Bunny talk. But in our grade, it prevailed. There was a boy named Tommy Jervis who claimed he saw them one night. The story was a little touch and go, as he also stated he was there making out with a girl in the ninth grade. But he did tell it, seemingly genuine, with great detail. And for whatever reason, even I felt myself believing him. Tommy told us he and the girl were about 50 yards into the cornfields on a Saturday night, around 1230. They just started necking when they heard the wind pick up. The corn stalks swayed, then twigs broke. The two stopped kissing and looked around. The girl screamed, and they realized they picked a spot right under a particularly tall and frightening scarecrow. There had been clouds over the moon when they entered the rose, making it extra dark. But with the full moon out now, the looming figure above was revealed. The girl kept saying it wasn't there before. She would have seen it. Tommy wasn't sure, but the wind picked up again. The corn stalk swayed up and down heavily like stormy waves. The scarecrow's arms caught the wind and swung down at them. The girl took off and Tommy followed. But as he did, he looked back and saw the post holding up the scarecrow had fallen over and was now empty. Tommy saw movement down the rows to his left, rushing towards him. It was the scarecrow plowing through the stalks, screeching out something that sounded like the cause of a thousand dead crows. Tommy caught up to the girl and pushed her forward the last several feet of the row. They tumbled out of the cornfield and onto normal grass. As they were laying there, Tommy swears he looked back and saw the scarecrow in the darkness of the rows, staring back out at him. But it didn't leave the field. It stayed in the shadows of the stalks, then disappeared back to its post. I didn't know what to believe, so I took any and all views on the disappearances seriously. Everything could help me track down whatever it was that took Anna and the other girls. As frightening or as unlikely as the scarecrow theory was, it was at least something I could make plans to combat against. It was a start. I planned to do it all by myself, but two others joined me. Pudge, my best friend, and Becca, 
who was Anna's best friend. Becca and Anna did everything together. They dressed similarly, coordinated the same color hair ribbons, and had matching pink woven bracelets with yellow butterflies on them. After Anna went missing, Becca looked like she'd lost part of her, and it was replaced by something angry and filled with rage, something I knew all too well. I approached Becca two weeks after the disappearance and told her I wanted to do something about Anna, about all the girls. What was going on had to stop, and the police force was too hamstrung with the union strikes to put any real time in, so it had to be us. Becca was in before I finished my pre-planned and rehearsed proposition to her, and she proved to be cunning and resourceful. She also had access and experience with her father's guns. Her dad was a heavy collector. Becca snagged a Smith & Wesson 38 six-shooter with a four-inch barrel for herself. It was small enough for her to carry and conceal, and she'd shot it several times and knew the minimal kickback well. Becca gave me a Remington 870 pump action She'd snuck it out of her dad's collection with 30 shells and told me to bike out to the quarry on the outskirts and practice. She met me there and showed me how to hold it to avoid the butt kicking back and hurting my shoulder. My aim improved and we added movement to my target practice with a Coke bottle swinging from a string attached to a high branch above. It was a good exercise. It got me following the target, finding its movement, entering a flow state, and predicting its back and forth motion. It wasn't bad. Becca was a perfect shot every time. We knew these weapons might not work if we were, in fact, facing something more supernatural. But the three of us had agreed the scarecrow idea was less likely, so we set out to disprove it. Pudge managed to get us some supplies, a set of walkie-talkies from the station, and several jerry cans of gasoline, which were in case bullets weren't enough. Becca wanted revenge more than I did. If it was the scarecrows, she wouldn't have hesitated to burn the entire field down. In her mind, it'd be worth it for Anna's memory. So we had motivation and weapons, and supplies. Then came the plan, and the other utility Becca offered, which was herself. Becca volunteered to be used as bait to draw our targets out. She was on the track team and could run for days. Though we weren't sure about who the abductors were, Becca had used her clout in school and asked around every grade. In the end, we had good authority that each one of the girls had gone missing in the fields. So at the very least, we were fishing in the right pond. We started off by mapping out the general locations of the scarecrows in the field. We knew Leyland moved them occasionally, but it was never much further than 10 or 20 feet. Corn is planted in rows, so we created a grid and sectioned it into four quarters. Each quarter had between 15 and 20 scarecrows set up in random placements. They were all tacked on to 18 foot tall posts. Since the corn was between seven and nine feet in height, the eyesores stood high. It took a full weekend, but we got them all drawn on the grid. Most of the scarecrows were at the center of the bottom right quadrant. This fit with our plan perfectly, as that portion of the cornfield ended with a forest. This helped in case of the possibility we were dealing with something or someone other than the scarecrows that weren't bound by the field's perimeter. A hundred yards into the woods, we dug a hole twelve feet deep and filled the bottom with sharpened sticks and branches that spiked up dangerously. 
we left a large bear trap uncovered in case anyone stumbled upon that part of the forest. But we built a loose cover for it out of leaves and loose twigs and branches for when we were ready to use it. We were going to send Becca into the cornfield at night. She'd take one of the walkies with her. We taped down the PTT button so it broadcast everything that was happening to her as she carried it. Pudge and I had the other walkie at the edge of the cornfield, listening in, shotgun in my hands, and an axe in his. We also had the jerry cans of gasoline and two large whiskey bottles fashioned into Molotov cocktails. Becca carried one as well, but hers was a beer bottle with a bandana crammed in its mouth. She taped a Zippo lighter to the neck of the bottle, making it quicker to ignite. All she needed to do is flick the flint wheel and a spark would catch. She wasn't fucking around. Becca would walk along the end rows, whistling innocently, moving at the same pace and perpendicular to Pudge and I outside the field. She'd come across multiple scarecrows on her path. After checking each one, she'd radio back that they were all just old clothes and hay. If any climbed down off their posts and attacked her, Becca would get into a foot chase with them, knowing full well the paths to take to bring her to the forest. With any luck, the scarecrows would follow her, but not be able to leave the field. This is where we could blow them apart or set fire to them. If it wasn't scarecrows and they followed her out of the fields, they'd fall into our trap, impaling themselves on the spikes. Then we'd set them on fire at the bottom of the pit, and after they burned up, we'd fill it back in with dirt. Whatever was abducting these girls, if it was happening in the fields, we were ready for them. After all the prep work we did on weekends, we spent every Friday and Saturday night in the rows dangling our bait. Weeks passed. Nothing was happening. We tried branching out further into the grid, hitting new batches of scarecrows and adjusting our routes. But still, the weeks came and went without incident in the fields. Not only that, but it had been three months since Anna had gone missing. That was the longest stretch between girls. We started wondering if whatever had been happening with the disappearances was over. If we'd missed our chance at revenge, or were we warding it off? Pudge was the first of us to throw in the towel. He was tired of spending his weekend nights out in the rows and didn't think whatever had been out there was still a threat. Pudge wasn't a huge loss, but he needed the walkies back as well, so that put an end to our weekend patrols. We all decided to do one more Saturday night, our last attempt to get our revenge. Of course, Pudge bagged out at the last minute, so it was just me and Becca. Since this had started, Becca and I spent hours together in the cornfields and the quarry. We talked on the phone and met up at diners and the town movie theater. It was like all of that was coming to an end now. We met up at 10.30 on the Saturday night and walked down to the cornfields together. This time when she entered the rows, she talked to me through the radio. She told me about Anna, about playing sports and taking classes with her, bike rides and swimming, how good of a friend she'd been. It was like a eulogy. It was beautiful, and Becca began to cry. I decided we were done for the night, and we were done holding on to what we were doing. Whatever it was had stopped, and we needed to move on. I went into the cornfields planning to tell Becca a new truth, which was that I was falling in love with her. Then I was going to kiss her. But just as I was approaching her, a heavy beam of light shot through the corn stalks, highlighting Becca between the rows. I ducked down as a man's voice yelled out. It was older, 
filled with authority, and it was familiar. It asked who was out there. With the light on her, Becca yelled out, identifying herself. The voice yelled back, approaching her. It was Sheriff Walkley. He asked if Becca was alone, and just as he did, I stepped backwards, snapping at Cornstalk. Walkley called out to me and shined his flashlight. I left my Remington hidden in the rows, revealed myself, and joined the two. Walkley looked exhausted. The Union strikes had taken up all his time and energy. And now tonight was his one quiet one, and there had been a call about some high schoolers out drinking in the cornfield. He couldn't find any, but stumbled upon Becca and me. He offered us a ride home in his cruiser. We declined, saying we were happy to walk back, but he insisted. We followed him back through the corn rows to the road where the sheriff's car was parked. I got in the front seat with him, and Becca got in the back. As he drove, Walkley developed a nervous air about him. I noticed him looking at Becca in his rearview mirror repeatedly. I think she did, too. It was quickly apparent he wasn't headed in the direction of either of our homes. But he chimed in that he had to stop at the old nickel mine in the south end of town to pick up a generator he'd left there. Walkley asked us what we were doing out at three in the morning on a Sunday and if our parents knew we weren't home, if anyone knew we weren't home. Without thinking, I'd answered that my mom knew. Walkley chuckled and said he doubted that. He continued driving and I was wishing more and more that I'd refused the lift offer and pushed for us to walk home. After ten minutes of driving and the town lights fading behind us, we pulled into the old nickel mine parking lot. Walkley got out and told me to come with him. He needed my help, then told Becca to stay in the car. I felt really nervous by that point. I told him I hurt my arm earlier and wouldn't be much help. Walkley stared at me, through the windshield and said, Get out. I couldn't move. I was too scared. Walkley got angry and marched over to my door. He opened and grabbed me by the arm, yanking me out of the car. He slammed the door and dragged me towards the mine entrance. As he pulled me, I heard one of the car doors slam behind us. I don't know where it came from, but a strange instinct took over and caused me to jump to the side. A gunshot roared out, then a second one. I tumbled but got my balance and looked back to see Becca with her thirty-eight pointed at a now toppled over Walkley. She'd caught him with both shots. The first hit him in the cheek, just below his right eye, which was now entirely red and sunken in. The second shot hit him in the neck, which was generating a considerable flow of blood out onto the ground. Becca walked over to Walkley and fired the remaining four shots into him. I got up and joined Becca. She lifted her left hand, revealing a dirt and blood-stained pink woven bracelet with yellow butterflies. It contrasted with the bright and clean one that was on her own wrist. Halfway into the drive to the mine, Becca had found Anna's bracelet, where she was sitting in Walkley's cruiser. It was crammed between a floor mat and the back seat. She didn't want to shoot him while he was driving and potentially cause a crash. She'd been biding her time, waiting for the safest and clearest shot. With the revelation that it was my best friend's father and the town sheriff, who was responsible for what was happening. Becca and I needed to decide what the next steps were. Our immediate reaction was to call it in, reveal that it was the sheriff who'd been taking the girls, destroy Pudge's life, throw the last bit of gasoline on the town to send it into a full bonfire. I'm a firm believer that anything that can be destroyed by the truth should be destroyed by the truth. 
that the chip should fall where they do. But back then, in that moment, we decided to hide it. My dad had taken me driving a few times, so we packed Walkley's body into the cruiser, and I drove it to the bear pit we dug. Becky and I dumped the body inside and filled it in. We left the sheriff's cruiser in an abandoned lot, and I walked Becca home. It wasn't perfect. There wasn't a perfect option. It was all a trade-off. We knew the town would be better off not knowing. But Pudge, would he fare better in the future, wondering what happened to his dad? Or knowing exactly what happened to him and why? We decided leaving Pudge with empty hope for his dad's return was the best option. At least he'd still view his father as a good man, even though he wasn't. Becca and I assumed the girls' bodies were somewhere down in the mine, shoved in a crevice or hidden in some chamber. But it was too dangerous for us to check. We waited a few months, then made an anonymous call to the new sheriff that there were bodies in the mine. A week later, Anna's body was discovered in the mine, as were the other five girls. Closure came to the family, and to Becca and I, but not Pudge. He fell heavily into depression, and his mother moved them to another state to live with relatives. Becca and I started dating. We stayed together through college, got married shortly after, and are still together to this day.